Welcome to Momentum Investing, property investing made easy. One of the world's top podcasts on property investing, bringing you the top experts in the field so you can learn firsthand what it takes to create passive income and take control over your financial future. Hi, and welcome to the Momentum Investing Podcast. I'm very excited to have you here. And today's episode is a great one. It was a pure pleasure to record this interview with Leo Hopf. Leo is an experienced business manager who's been working in helping corporations, helping entrepreneurs grow their businesses for decades. What makes him different from most other management consultants and what made this interview so unique is that a few years back, he partnered up with the head volleyball coach at a division one school, one of the legends in the, in the business. And they were able to put together the best from the sports world and the business world into a perfect mix that allows you to grow as an entrepreneur and grow faster reaching goals that you maybe never would have expected. Because there are things in these two business industries that are so different. The way in sports, how we compete, how we grow as an individual, how we set goals and how we achieve them. And in business, how we find the systems, how we manage our processes, how we work with KPIs, and how we find our success are two very different ways of reaching the same goal. We take the best from both worlds, you get a truly magnificent journey. That's what we're going to explore here together in the Momentum Investing Podcast. My name is Daniel Wood. I'll be your host here for today. And we are very excited to have you. So please make sure you subscribe to our podcast so you get updates on all the exciting episodes we have coming out. We've had guests on as like Kim Kiyosaki, Jordan Harbinger, Ben Chai, Simon Zucci, people from all over the world, all types of industries. And we are now going to help you take your next step in your business. So thank you so much for joining us here today. Let's get into the interview right away with Leo Hopf. Welcome to the Momentum Investing Podcast. I am honored to be here today with Leo Hopf. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Daniel. I'm excited to be here. I'm, I've been looking forward to this. Uh, so have I. I mean, you were nice, em- as nice enough to send me your book. I really appreciated <laughs> that. And so I've been really looking forward to this interview. You were actually introduced to me by Judy R- Romanette, who's yep. been a guest on this show, who specifically spoke about connecting good people. And for some reason, she connected us. Uh- <laughs> Wait, Ju- Judy was actually the first reader of my first book, uh, Rethink, Reinvent, Reposition. Two days after it was out, she sent me an email uh, quoting something on page 283, oh. uh, which was kind of astounding. So that's how we, that's actually how we met. And then she didn't know where it was. Turns out we lived about a mile and a half from each other. She, she didn't know any place where it was in the world. So. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Judy is so cool. Uh, well, one thing I, I wanted to bring up right away, because you got, you got your book there right over your shoulder, yep. read the title and the, the title is interesting. It's stop competing and start winning. So what's the difference? I mean, for a lot of us, you know, you compete to win. So what's the yep. difference? Why should I start competing? And how do I then start winning? Well, the, the competing, you know, most organizations, uh, I would say just compete hard. Uh, it's, not a mesh, it's not an issue of are they working hard or not? You know, no one's had free time since the 90s. Everyone's working hard. So it's not a, it's not a laziness issue. But if you're just competing hard, what that means is success will either, uh, it's sort of like a roll of the dice. If you're lucky it'll come. If you're not, it won't. If you're designed to win, stop competing and start winning. If you're designed to win, that means you've got all the pieces in place that you need such that success will flow year after year, deal after deal. It becomes much less of a, a risk. You know, the pieces you need are things like a, a, an understanding of your vision. What is it that you're really trying to accomplish? Uh, how do you get the most out of your people? Most most people, uh, organizations, uh, they don't get the most out of their stars and they spend way too much time in their underperformers. We can talk about that. Yeah, yeah. The, they try to lift the underperformers to average while instead of getting the the good and great to amazing. Yeah, and, and it's interesting, you know, the, the uh, subtitle of the book is The Business of Coaching. Right. Uh, stop competing and start winning the business of coaching. I wrote this book you know, I've got more than 30 years as a management consultant, so I work on the business world. But I, my co-author, Beth Lanier, has been a head coach in the highest level of sports in the United States for the last 31 years. And what you find are that people in different fields know different things. 
And I know plenty of things that Beth doesn't know. And she knows tons of things that I didn't know. And I was amazed at how taking some of these best uh, uh, aspects of sport into the world of business can make my business story stronger. When we started out, Beth had called me in to help with some of her organizational problems in sports. And so, you know, what you find is things that are easy for people with one set of experience are virtually impossible for, for, for things uh, with somebody else's experience and, li- and the other way around. So, for example, in business, you know, we're way better than sports and things like organization, delegation, processes, procedures, you know, because you have to handle a 30,000 person uh, company. Yeah, exactly. But sports is way better than business and things like individual development right. uh, and things like team development and things like passion. You know, they, they kick butt on anything that happens in business left, right and center. And they have the advantage of having a public win loss record. So you can tell at a glance are they winning or not inside <laughs> of business. You really don't know. No, you, know, you exactly. can see what's their annual return on equity, et cetera. But, but there are so many things that are hidden away uh, and it's easy to sort of paper over mistakes in business in the way you can't in athletics. No, definitely, definitely. I, I mean, that, that reminds me of one of the things, one of my first uh, mentors I ever had, he, uh, he told me when we were starting our, our first company, he said, the best thing you can do is not look at your competitors look at what people are doing in other industries and appropriate their best practices into yours. Yep. And you just did that, but you didn't even go into other businesses. You just went all the way into the sports world and took a completely different industry and just appropriated their, their skill set. Well, you know, it's, it's funny on the last last page of the book, we we tried to make this point. And what I did is I said, here's a volleyball problem, an athletics problem that I can't solve. And so I wrote down a problem just to show, that mm-hmm. Beth has things that I don't know. Yeah. Beth looked at it and just started laughing, crossed off what I had written down and then wrote a real volleyball problem because not only did I not know enough to solve it, I didn't know enough to specify yeah, what a typical even know real problem to ask was. The question, right. And, and so you really do find out, you just don't know what you don't know. And, and the idea of, of you know, if you've, been in, if you've been in a field for a long time, you know, the, the learning curve, it always goes up. There's always more to learn, but it yeah. does start to flatten out. You know, you, you see fewer new things after you've been in an industry for 20 years than you did when you first enter it. And so the idea of, of I, I was amazed at how much my learning accelerated by taking many of the same ideas, just applying them to a different field where they have different assumptions. Uh, and it turns out, you know, you, you think you, okay, I know how to solve problems in business. Take those same solutions with these. It doesn't work with 18 year old kids. You know, how do you? you know, who've been superstars all their lives, how do you deal with these things? And, and that's, you know, it's, it, one of the fun parts of, of writing a book is, is what you learn that you, you thought you already understood before writing. Yeah, no, absolutely. I can imagine. So, so let's, let's put this in, in uh, for me, I'm going to be a little egotistical now and just hijack <laughs> this interview and say, all right, so say for me, I'm a property investor now. Yep. And I don't want to be competing anymore. I want to win. I want to build my property empire. What are the kind of things that I need to think about? What are, what are the, what is the difference from me going out and just competing as a property investor and me winning as a property investor? Well, let's start with vision and then we'll move on to people. Yep. You know, what is your vision? Is it that you want to be a Daniel, you want to have an empire or is it that you want to work hard for five years and then retire? Right. Uh, that's two or is it, different goals that our students have. Some people want the empire. Some just want, I want to quit my job. I love, I got a beach on Bali that's just waiting for me. <laughs> yeah. Or, or is it maybe they just want a, a nice little side uh, earner uh, that makes your life easier. So right off the bat, if you're not clear about what you're trying to accomplish, it's going to be pretty hard to do it. Yep. Uh, you know, even if you're clear, it doesn't guarantee you're going to do it, but it makes it a heck of a lot easier. Well, it's like the, I love the Alice in Wonderland quote when uh, Alice comes to, uh, you know, the fork in the road and she looks up at the Cheshire cat and says, which way should I go? And he looks down and says, well, where, where do you want to go? He says, I don't know. Well, then it doesn't matter. Doesn't doesn't ma- it? Then it doesn't matter. Exactly right. <laughs> so, so I agree. Yeah. You have to have that clear vision. So uh, you got to know, are you building an empire? Are you building for freedom? Are you just trying to get a little extra every month? Or, or something completely different that you and me haven't come up with yet. So what is your then, goal? Yeah. 
And then most likely, Daniel, you're not going to be able to do it yourself. You're yep. going to have to have a team. You're going to need accountants. You're going to need lawyers. You're going to need appraisers. You're going to need uh, uh, other investors. Oh, yeah. And for us and, as international investors, we work so much with local teams. I mean, I'm sitting in Sweden and then I'm doing deals over in the UK. So I have to have my local sourcing agents, people who find the deals, the project managers. And then, as you said, I need to have investors because I want someone else to pay for the deals, right? <laughs> and and here's, some, here's one of the interesting things are, you know, if you're, if you're running a big company, all of your team is underneath you. You, you control them. You, you give them their, their bonuses and rewards and, and you have control. But most likely, you don't control your team members. They're individual organizations. Oh, yeah. They're all and essentially subcontractors brought exactly in right. one specific project, one specific time. And they can fire me just as easy as I can fire them. And you have less of a chance to impose your will upon them. Exactly. But what you can do is impose your expectations upon them. Right. Because when you think about, uh, you know, let's think about sort of the, the range of people that you're going to work with. You know, you've got, you know, maybe there's sort of a, a normal distribution type. You know, 80 to 90% of the people are in the middle. They're, they're sort of solid performers. They can do their job. They, they can do the job they're paid to do. Right. The uh, they're not, uh, they're not going to but... wow you, but they're good, solid people. Yeah. Then you got five to 10% who are the stars, the people who have vision, who have talent, intelligent, drive, who have everything you need, who really can change the game for you. They, they, can, they can elevate you above and beyond what you can do yourself. Right. And then you had the other people, the five to 10% on the bottom side, the underperformers. Hmm. Uh, and in the book, we call them C performers. You say A are stars, B solid, Cs are the, the underperformers. Right. And the challenge is, you know, you want to spend your time with the stars, but you spend way too much of it with the underperformers, right? Because the underperformers are causing trouble. Mm -hmm. They don't deliver uh, his promise and everyone's waiting on them. Well, yeah, they I, I think you're a here, great example of that. Deliver I, I, there. I got a property in uh, uh, right outside. It's outside London in one of the boroughs there. And you know, it, it's a joint venture. We brought in a partner who's supposed to do the deal and deal with it, Yep. but they've done a horrible job. I mean, straight up horrible. And, you know, we, it's to the point where we'd like to sell the property and get out of it, but the property is in so bad shape that we can't sell it. Uh, so it's, you know, a catch 22. And <laughs> uh, so it's one of those ironic, but that obviously sucks in a lot of our time. While I also yep. have my development team where we've built a, a team of six superstars where I want to be putting all my energy into because they're, you know, we can do two deals a month and we can build, you know, we yep. can do 30, 30 or so deals this year, but yet I'm getting pulled into this project that is just, you know, it's draining time and straining energy. And it's just not, not the best use of, of anyone's time. And the, the challenge is, you know, that people, oftentimes they want to think of their, their team as their family. And you hear so many organizations say we're a family organization. Yeah. Well, think of you were a family. If you have a, suppose you have a family and you have a teenage child and that child is starting to act up and get in trouble with the law. Mm. Just give up on that kid and move on to the next one. <laughs> well, you just fire the kid. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, you'd you like to make another that. one, right? Yeah. <laughs> but what do you do? You spend more time and attention on the troublemaker. And in a family, that's exactly the right thing to do. You'd be heartless if you didn't. You yep. have to spend time getting them going. But if you do that in an organization, whether it's for people who work for you or whether it's partners who don't, you're dooming yourself to failure because that's you're going to spend all of your time. Leo, I got to say, that's a great comparison because I've, I've, I've always... You know, all, every manager, every mentor I've had has always said that, you know, don't get pulled into the, the low down, low performers, folks on the yep. high ones. But I've never thought about that. The reasoning why, because obviously as a father, you know, I got three young kids. Obviously, if one of them got in trouble, I would, you know, they would get all my time and, you know, all the time and love and energy they need to get out of it. Uh, but that's interesting because I, it's, it's as you say, as a business leader, we tend to want to act in that same way because we know, you know, we know the potential they have and we want to, we want to save them and turn them around, but that takes us away from our superstars and, and doesn't allow us to give them the time they deserve. And if you take a, 
terrible performer and turn them into a minimally acceptable performer, mm -hmm. that's not going to revolutionize your business. No, exactly. If you take a star and leverage them into new opportunities and ideas you hadn't even envisioned, that will revolutionize your business. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, that people spend all this, you know, that they think about, you know, stars, they're, they're happy to have stars. Problem is, they don't do a good job developing them. Because stars by their nature are so talented, they can outperform any of the solid performers without breaking a sweat. Oh, yeah, exactly. And so most of the time you get way too little out of your stars because you don't push them hard enough. They're just coasting through on, on pure talent. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's a pretty good life. You know, I'm, I'm always rated at the top and everyone likes me and I do a great job. The problem is that takes a star and turns them into a great performer, a step down. It takes a great performer, turns them into a good performer. Yeah. If you're gonna develop your stars, you have to push them, push them, push them until they fail. Mm. If they're not failing, you're not stretching them enough. Right. And too often, we define stars as people who don't fail. Mm. And if you do that, think, think about, you know, Daniel, I'm sure you've been a star all of your, your career. What happens if you start defining your self-worth as the person who never fails? All of a sudden, you stop taking on super challenging things that you might fail on. Yeah, exactly. You become you start like, playing, like the lawyers in movies who are 60 and 0 and then never take a tough case because they will break exactly their, right. their winning streak. And so you start learning more slowly. There's a great example I, I put in the book. There's a, a juggler, you know, a juggler with three, four, five balls called Taylor Glenn. And she had a channel on Instagram, uh, started out with a thousand people. Now she has 130,000 followers. Right. And most people on the web will do something 50 times, take the one take that they actually did it right and post that. Right. But she focused instead on all of her failures. So every time she's juggling a new trick, she failed. And that's what she posted. And so it's failure after failure after failure. And as soon as she stopped failing because she could do the trick, she moved on to the next one. Right. And People love that because people always hide their failures. And after two they, years, and now people could watch and learn with her. Obviously, they watched and learned. And after two years, she set the Guinness Book of World Records for most three ball tricks in one minute. Thirty nine different three ball tricks because she had learned so many things. And as soon as she could do one, she moved on to the next. Right. So she made herself the world champion by failing. Yeah, very cool. And we don't think of that. We think of failure as geez, you get one chance and now you've proven you can't do it. Well, if you're not, you know, if you look at your 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 underperformers, they're not failing a lot because they don't do anything. No, exactly. And so no, I like do... that. I like that. And and I mean, that's a lot what we've done. Actually, that is a big reason why Momentum Property Education was started in the first place is when we started out in our investment journey, I mean, we got ripped off by builders, ripped off by business partners. We lost money to currency exchange. I mean, we made every mistake in the book and we're on the brink of bankruptcy. And so many of our videos that we do or, or things we do with our clients are about talking about all the screw ups we've done yep. so that they can avoid them. And, and, I, and I think that that's been a big part of momentum success because that's really why we're doing it because we know I mean, when I see a new investor come and they're all excited and ready, it's like they're, they're running straight for a cliff with a dozen mistakes that I know if I just tell them quickly what they are, they can miss every one. Yeah. But if no one tells them they're going to fall down and most people don't get up again. Exactly right. But yeah, so how about tonight. that? What if, what if I take one of my superstars? So say I got one of my superstars here or I am a superstar yeah. and I'm pushing myself so hard and society has obviously identified me as I'm a superstar because I never fail. And now I'm pushing myself so hard, you know, I'm taking on such big projects that I do fail. That, that can be a, an image, both external and internal, like crash. And I, I can imagine this is probably one of the things that Beth probably bought, brought to the table because one of my friends played professional baseball. Yep. And he, he would talk about, you know, when he started playing in the minor leagues, a lot of the players break down because, you know, throughout their career, you know, they were the best kid in Little League, you know, they were the yes. star of the town. And then they go to high school and they're the best player that's ever played in that high school. And then they get to college 
and it is a little more competitive, but they're still the star of the co college team. And then they get to the minor leagues, and it turns out that everyone was batting 400. Every one of these <laughs> players were superstars. Everyone was the talk of the town, and now they're just average. And then someone else is a superstar in this place, yeah. and they're just average. And a lot of people just fizzle out. They're, they're not able to raise their game and get to that next level. So, so what do I do with that? I mean, that's a risk I'm taking. You know, how do I make sure that this person handles that failure? Well, a lot of it is how you present it. You know, and, and by the way, just let's just take your buddy's uh, 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 baseball example. If you're batting 400, you're a superstar in baseball. But what that means is four times you're safe and six times you're out. Oh, yeah, yeah. Baseball so is it's such still, an impressive game. It's still most, <laughs> most likely you're going to get out rather than succeed. So, yep. you know, stars are built on upping their percentages, not doing everything right all the time. You know, one of the key things I learned from, from Beth, and this is, this is I, I really hadn't thought about this before, is you can't compare stars to, to other players. You have to compare stars to stars. Right. So in soccer world, if you have Ronald, Ronaldo, yeah. a superstar, and you compare him to anyone on his team, he could beat them in his sleep. So you would compare Ronaldo to Messi. Right. Or, or one when of the other superstars. When you're coaching Ronaldo, you're not talking about the other attacker on the other side. You're talking about Messi, his biggest kind of rival as a superstar. Exactly right. So if I'm, if, if I'm talking to, to someone who's got wonderful potential, their potential star, I'm not saying, hey, you did better than the three other people in the organization. I'm saying if you want to make a legacy like this person who you've idolized, this is a necessary part of the process. And now what can we learn from it and how can we uh, do better? We may make another mistake, um, but if we keep making those mistakes, we're going to push through it. And right. so that idea of... So again, and, you're going back to the vision. You're not going into the project <laughs> and talking about like this project, win or lose, you're talking yes. about, you, you find an idol, you know, for, for business, for investing, it could be your Warren Buffett, or, you know, obviously he's the best investor or top investor of all time. So a lot of us investors idolize him. So, but he made mistakes as well. So you kind In of- In fact, he said, you know, Warren paradigm. Buffett said that the biggest mistakes I ever made were not the things I invested in that went bad. It's the things I could have invested in, but didn't. Yeah. And nobody ever knew about those. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but those are that's where I left value on the table. Yeah. And it's it's this idea of getting comfortable with failure because you, you only get so many stars. Hmm. You, know, you don't have a chance, okay. Well, this star, uh, if his ego gets bruised and all of a sudden I I can't pull him out of it, I'll just move on to the next. There's only so many stars. Yeah. And if you're if you're trying to achieve your vision, whether it's to, to you know, hit the, the beach with your own island or if it's to build your empire, that's going to happen because of the stars you align yourself with. The solid players, you need them, absolutely need them in order to get things done. But that's really the execution side. That's not the, the revolution side. That's what the stars do. Right. But if we go to that other end, that the underperformers, the challenge of the underperformers, people totally underestimate their cost of the organization. Now you gave an example of how you had an underperform and it just sort of rippled through. Yeah. And that's what underperforms. Of course they do their own job bad, but that's actually the least of your worries. They prevent other people who are waiting for their inputs to do their job because they're always late. Right. Uh, they uh, underperformers will never hire stars because they don't want to be outshined. So they're hire other underperformers. Right. And the longer you allow underperformance, the more it looks like you don't understand what the heck you're doing. Yeah. Either you don't understand that they're not doing their job or that you understand it and that you're perfectly happy that your expectations are set so low, yeah. you're willing to accept that. Right. And, and in fact, the no most organization wants to work with an underachiever or an organization that appreciates them. Yeah, no one does. I mean, it, it's it's a reflection on you. So you're not, most of the time when you're putting a deal together, Daniel, they're not going to see you. They're going to see your team members. Yeah, exactly. And if what they see is, well, Daniel is represented by these people who I wouldn't let clean my office at the end of the day, <laughs> yeah. that's not going to uh, uh, make me feel warm and fuzzy about your capabilities and your, your skills as a leader. 
Yeah. And in fact, most organizations, the rule is the longer someone is underperformed, the harder it is to get rid of them. Yeah. Well, this guy is 50 years old. You know, he's been with us 20 years. Yes. And each year he's stolen the company's money because yeah. he has not earned what you paid him. So how is it that he has more right to his job today than a new underperformer? But sometimes we just get into that momentum. You know, hey, I've got a partner. It would take a lot of time and effort to, to switch off. And I'll just, I'll just let this guy go. And I'll, you know, I'll pick up the slack. I'll do a little extra work myself. Yeah. Well, that's a terrible way of handling it because it doesn't solve the problem. It just, it just ensures that you're going to deal with it year after year after year. It probably makes it worse as well because they never... Well, I think one problem for underperformers as well is that they're often never told that they're underperformers with, you know, they're coddled, which means they don't actually know that they should be raising their game and, and they start coasting on that low level. You know, if you, if you had 50 underperformers in a room and you ask them, how good are you? Every one of them will say, when I look in the mirror in the morning, I see a star. Yeah. But you know, I'm a star, but I'm treated unfairly by the world. Mm. And people don't recognize all I do for them. They're sort of ungrateful. Right. And so one of the big challenges with underperformers is they don't see themselves as that. They see them as misunderstood stars. Right. And in large part, because people are terrible at giving feedback. So, Daniel, if I say, uh, you know, I'd, Daniel, I'd, I'd like it if you, you know, pick up the, the pace a little bit. Mm. You, you're going to hear that. And it's not going to catalyze any change whatsoever. Okay, you know, that's, you know, just a little bit input, et cetera. Yeah. There's a, a great tool called the left-hand column, which you may have uh, used before. Uh, it was in the book called The Fifth Discipline by Sang. And the idea is how do you give hard feedback in a way people can understand it? Right. And the way it is, you draw, you draw a line down the center of a page. And on the right-hand column, you write down the things you were going to say. They're sort of nice and polite and, and aren't, going to, aren't going to cause a lot of conflict. Right. Well, I'd like to see you go a little faster. Um, I think we could have gotten more out of that deal if we just pushed it a little harder. Yeah. And then the left-hand column, you put down what you truly and honestly believe. Yeah. You screwed us in that last deal, and we had to, to uh, take something we shouldn't have because you messed up. Yeah. Uh, you are ruining my reputation in the marketplace because you're not acting professionally. Now, if you started with the left-hand column, people would shut down. It's just too harsh. They'd never yeah. listen to it. So instead, you start with the right-hand column. Well, I'd like you to move, you know, this is where I was going to say, but Daniel, if I'm really honest with myself and with you, this is what I honestly believe. And then you go through the left-hand column. <laughs> and by doing the right-hand column first, you sort of open them up a little bit to sort of non-threatening. Right. And then you show them you're treating them as a professional by saying, if I'm honest with myself and you, here's what I honestly believe. And you can then open them up to hard feedback in a way they may never have gotten in their entire lives. Right. Because most feedback is, well, you're doing okay, could do a little bit better here. And in fact, that's sort of you know, a lot of uh, performance evaluations. You know, what are the three areas of improvement? What are the three strengths? Well, everyone has three things. It's easy just to say, okay, I got the, the you said last year that was my strength. You said last year was my improvement. Fine. It moves on, nothing happens because yeah. this, the feedback is not clear and specific and true enough to get through. And so people always think, well, yeah, everyone's always, you know, nothing never goes perfect. So of course, there's a couple of things to improve on. They don't think, my goodness, this relationship, Daniel's going to dump my company in the next three months if I don't change the way I work with him. And that's what you need to do. You need to, you need, and this is not being, you know, when people talk about having a family organization, what that means is, in part, while we're friendly, we're helpful, we're in it together, but it also means we treat each other as professional. Yeah. As a professional, I need to understand if you have real issues with my performance. Yeah. If you don't tell me and I don't improve, really the fault's on you yeah. because I didn't know. If you tell me clearly and I don't improve, the fault's on me. Yeah. Too often, we just say, well, you yeah, do a little bit better and then move on. You can't move on. You can't accept substandard performance because as soon as you do, that ripples throughout and all of a sudden people don't see an organization that wows them. They see an organization that says, geez, I can do better elsewhere. Hmm. 
Yeah, no, agreed. Agreed. That is brilliant. Sa I, I want to ask so much more, but we're running out of time. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I will have to ask if we want to learn more. Uh, I already got the book and I'm yeah. guessing that's the first stop for everyone to stop competing and start winning, get the book. And I know it's on Amazon, so I can add the link to that. Is there anywhere else that they can get the book? Uh, you can get pretty much anywhere, any, any bookseller, uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble and online in person, if, if there are any in-person bookstores left, uh, but you can get it hardbound paperback. Uh, it's The audio book just came out last week oh, wow. uh, and Kindle. Uh, and so Stop Competing and Start Winning, the Business of Coaching is the, the new book. My uh, first book was Rethink, Reinvent, Reposition. And that's really a business strategy book that talks about how do you make changes to your business model when everyone's busy running the business? So if you're thinking about how to optimize a portfolio, how to uh, uh, understand where in the life cycle, what parts are, are rising up, what parts are into decline, uh, that's the, the Rethink book. Both of them are on Amazon. And you can also go to uh, leohoff.com, uh, H-O-P is in Peter Epson, Frank, leohoff.com, my website. You can send me a message. I'd be, uh, uh, love to get messages from uh, people here, things with any questions or comments. Uh, uh, do that on leohoff.com. Awesome. All right. So I'll add a link to Amazon where you can pick up both books. Excellent. Thank you, Daniel. leohoff.com. So that's one word, L-E-O-H-O-P-F.com. Awesome, Leo. I really appreciate you taking the time. This was this was great. Everyone, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for joining us. And I got some exciting news for you in a moment. So stay tuned. Thank you, Daniel. So thank you so much again for joining us here on the Momentum Investing Podcast. I have some very exciting news here for you. We have in Momentum Property Education, you probably know we teach property investing. Our goal is to help you get all the tools you need to succeed and grow your property portfolio. To that end, we've created some of the best courses in the property industry, at least we think so, <laughs> that give high level education. For our mentorship students, our mastermind members, we also introduce you to some of the top sourcing agents, accountants, solicitors, mortgage brokers, banks, everyone you need in your team in order to achieve. The one thing that's been missing, and that is usually the hardest for new investors, is the ability to raise finance. Now, we teach 25 sources of capital to make that a little easier, 25 ways you can fund a property deal. But now, we've just taken the next step. We've recently come to an agreement with a crowdfunding platform called Max Crowdfund. We are now the official partner for Sweden, for, for Northern Europe, and we can now help you do deals in the UK and we'll be able to help you finance those deals through the crowdfund. We can now help you with up to 80% financing on your purchase, refurb and all the costs and everything. This is an amazing step that will make it so much easier for you to grow your portfolio. This is something we offer to our mentorship and mastermind students so that you get that extra step. We're very excited now to have all three parts of the property journey. We can help you with financing both this new lending that gives you 80% of your total project costs, we can give you, we'll teach you 25 ways of financing the last 20%, as well as the high level education and the team that will allow you to pull it off. If you want to start your journey with us, if you're interested in the mentorship, you can go to getmomentummentor.com. That's getmomentummentor.com to, uh, to apply for the mentorship program. We also have a free introductory course. If you're just getting interested in property, go to MomentumGift.com. It's MomentumGift.com and you'll learn the three simple steps to property investing and the three most common mistakes that new investors make and that you have to avoid. So thank you again so much for joining us. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast because next week we're actually interviewing a couple of our students. Lotta and Michael Wesley are joining us on the show and they're going to describe how they went from incredible success in business to near bankruptcy or actually pretty much bankruptcy and then how they've turned it around and are now doing property again. Basically, it's a Hollywood story that's coming on the show. They've done such an amazing job and we wanted them to share what they did so that you can take the highs they had and avoid the lows. So I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. Again, get MomentumMentor.com, MomentumGift.com. Make sure you subscribe. See you soon.